Most everyone knows this tune. It is Johannes Brahms' lullaby. But did you know that it was meant for the Christmas season? As a matter of fact, there are quite a few lullabies written for Christmas. As I, your host, Tristan Andrew, will explain. Let's investigate this. Let me be up front on this. Most lullabies originate in folk culture, not art music. A lullaby, or cradle song, is a soothing song, or piece of music that is usually played for or sung to children. In some societies, lullabies pass down cultural knowledge or tradition. But the primary purpose is as a sleep aid for infants. As a result, the music is often simple and repetitive. Lullabies can be found in many countries and have existed since ancient times. What makes the best lullaby has actually been studied fairly extensively. When there is harmony, infants almost always prefer consonant intervals over dissonant intervals. Tonally, most lullabies are simple, often merely alternating tonic and dominant harmonies. Most use intermittent repetitions and long pauses between sections. Rhythmically, lullabies are usually in triple meter or 6-8 time, giving them a characteristic swinging or rocking motion. Lullabies almost never have instrumental accompaniments. Infants have shown a strong preference for unaccompanied lullabies over accompanied lullabies. Again, this appeals to infants' more limited ability to process information. Lullabies are often used for their soothing nature, even for non-infants. One study found lullabies to be the most successful type of music or sound for relieving stress and improving the overall psychological health of pregnant women. Of course, we can find lullabies in art music. Lullabies written by established art music composers are often given the form name Persus, French for lullaby or cradle song. The most famous lullaby is the one by Johannes Brahms, which I will talk about later. Polish exile Frédéric Chopin's Persus is a composition for solo piano, not necessarily a likely instrument in the nursery. So, it is hard to imagine that he really saw it being used to soothe a child to sleep. Other famous examples of the genre include Maurice Ravel's Bersus sur la nom de Gabriel Fauré for violin and piano, the elegiac Bersus by Ferruccio Busoni, the Bersus from Benjamin Godard's opera Jocelyn, the lullaby from Igor Stravinsky's first ballet with Fokine, the Firebird, and the American George Gershwin's lullaby for string quartet. English composer Nicholas Maas 
orchestral nocturne, The World in the Evening, is subtitled Lullaby for Large Orchestra. The last movement from German composer Paul Greiner's suite from the realm of Pan is entitled Pan Sings the World a Lullaby. So, it is clear that art music lullabies are more artificial constructs to suggest sleeping aids rather than actual cradle songs. So what does the term lullaby have to do with art music for Christmas? Many Christmas carols are designed as lullabies for the infant Jesus, the most iconic of them being Franz Gruber and Josef Moore's Stille Nacht, Silent Night. Many medieval English verses associated with the birth of Jesus take the form of a lullaby, including Lule, my liking, my dear son, my sweeting, and maybe versions of contemporary lullabies. Let's look at some of the art music we can associate both with Christmas and with cradle songs. It may surprise you to learn that probably the most iconic of all Western lullabies takes the form of a Mary and Jesus lullaby. Brahms' Lullaby, Opus 49, number 4, is a lead, that's German for song, for voice and piano which was first published in 1868. It is one of the most iconic leader by Brahms. He based the music of his lullaby partially on Sis Andersht, a duet by Alexander Baumann, published in the 1840s. The lullaby was dedicated to Brahms' friend Bertha Faber on the birth of her second son. Brahms had been in love with her in her youth and constructed the melody of the lullaby to suggest as a hidden counter melody, a song she used to sing to him. It was first performed in public in December 1869 in Vienna, sung by Louise Dustmann, and performed on piano by Clara Schumann. The lyrics of the second verse were adapted from an 1849 poem by Georg Scherer, with reference to the Christ child in the Nativity.
while most are familiar with Brahms' 1868 lullaby, it was not his only Christmas lullaby. Perhaps the most notable of his Christmas lullabies is the gentle, lyrical, Geistliche Vegan Lied, Sacred Lullaby, Opus 91, Number 2, one of two songs published in 1884 in part as a futile attempt to reconcile the troubled marriage of his dear friends Yosef and Amalie Joachim. The two songs, or Gazanga, for alto with viola and piano, Opus 91, are unique in Brahms's output and are his only example of vocal chamber music. They were both published in 1884. The first song was written in 1884 and set to a nature poem. It was written when the Joachim pair were expecting their first child, who was named after Brahms. It is the second song that is known as the Sacred Lullaby. It was written much earlier in 1864. Brahms used the hymn tune Josef Lieber Josef Mein, Joseph Dearest Joseph Mein, to set Gabel's translation of Lope de Vega's 16th century Cantar Chilio de la Virgia, a Marian Jesus lullaby. The juxtaposition produced an excellent multi-layered song. The viola is on an equal level with the singer, who must be an alto, the voice type that most matches this instrument. This lullaby is a marvelous old Catholic song, consoling, soothing, and soft-edged, rising only briefly to highlight the momentary distress of the infant Jesus.
Our third German Christmas lullaby comes from Engelbert Humperdinck, born in 1854 and dying in 1921. Though Humperdinck wrote a great deal of music in a variety of genres, he is best remembered for a single opera, Hansel und Gretel, from 1893, based on the familiar fairy tale. Humperdinck's musical style is infused with elements of the German folk tradition, but the composer's primary influence was clearly the music of the Colossus, Richard Wagner. Humperdinck worked as an assistant to Wagner for a time at Bayreuth, even providing extra music for a scene change in the master's final opera. Parsifal of 1882. Humperdinck's sister, Adelheid Wette, wanted to put on a show for a family children's party and hit on the idea of dramatizing the Grimm brothers' tale of Hansel and Gretel. She asked her brother if he would write a little music for her project, and the resulting entertainment went off so well that he decided to expand his work into a three-act opera. Humperdinck had the great inspiration to send his completed score to Richard Strauss, who, prior to tackling Friedrich Nietzsche's Das Spex Zarathustra, immediately recognized its excellence. Strauss conducted the opera's premiere during Advent, and it vaulted instantly into fame. With the support of Strauss, the rest of the opera's story is a matter of history. In the pantomime, our titular brother-sister pair sleep in the woods with 14 angels guarding them. It incorporates the famous evening prayer motif in which Humperdinck inserted his central leitmotif, leading motif, of the opera that ties it to Christian themes. When distress is at its height, our Lord Christ will put it right. This orchestral conclusion to the second act is full of music that is sweet and beguiling. It combines childlike simplicity with heart-aching beauty. Is it actually a lullaby? Well, no. And yet, there is a real sense of comfort in the music that makes us think of safety, calm, and tenderness that is the heart of every lullaby. The opera itself has been associated with Christmas since its earliest performances, 
and today it is still most often performed at Christmas time. This is thanks to the timing of its debut and the additions Humperdinck made to increase that association.
now we shift from German composers to French composers. Our first French Christmas lullaby is by Jules Massenet. Born in 1842, dying in 1912. A composer best known today for the operas Manon, Cendrillon, Werther, and the solo violin Meditation from Thais. During his lifetime, Massenet was one of the most prolific and celebrated opera composers on earth. The public anxiously awaited his output, and Massenet became both wealthy and famous, practicing his craft. His legacy reflects his ability to create music which portrays the intimacy of human relationships and the emotions and conflicts that arise from them. His gift for melody can be seen in a variety of arias that are among the most beautiful in the French opera repertory. He was also a brilliant orchestrator, a skill which allowed him to capture the moods and colors of a wide variety of places and eras. In addition to opera, Massenet composed songs, oratorios, ballets, and orchestral works, as well as chamber music and works for solo piano. Like Humperdinck, Massenet understood how to use an instrumental adagio to suggest conditions conducive to rest and sleep. Generally, when we think of Christmas lullabies, we think of Mary singing Jesus to sleep. That is not the case in this pseudo-lullaby, as is evident from its place in the oratorio La Virge, meaning the Virgin. The oratorio presents four scenes by Massenet to a French libretto by Charles Grand Mougin. It was first performed at the Opera in Paris on May 22, 1880. It recounts the story of the Virgin Mary from the Annunciation to her Assumption into Heaven. This adagio is an orchestral interlude of Mary's last night on earth in the final scene. Although the Virgin itself was not popular as a whole, the orchestral segment, The Last Sleep of the Virgin, Le Dernier Sommet de la Virge, remains a popular encore piece to this day and often appears on recordings of Christmas art music. It is a short, melting example of why the music of Massenet was so respected and admired in his native France during his lifetime.
carving out sleepy music from large scale works is not the only place we can find lullabies. Composer and conductor Henri Busset, born in 1872 and dying in 1973, seems to have met every important French composer in his long life. In 1889, he attended the Conservatoire, studying with Ernest Guiro, Charles Gounod, César Franck, Charles-Marie Vidor, and Massenet. In 1893, Busset won second place honors for his Prix de Rome cantata based on Antigone, and shortly thereafter became a choral conductor at the Opera Comique in Paris. Busset assumed direction of the chorus in the first production of Claude Debussy's Pelias and Melisande in 1902. Though Debussy found fault with Busset's direction, the two became fast friends, and Busset's orchestration of Debussy's early Petite Suite is his most frequently revived orchestral score. In his later years, Busset adopted some aspects of impressionistic style and made expert use of them, but he remained essentially beholden to the post-romantic ethos of Franck and Massenet. Some of his latest music betrays the influence of Gounod and even Wagner. Busset made countless arrangements of works by other composers, edited two volumes of music by Jean-Philippe Rameau in collaboration with Paul Ducat, and completed Georges Bizet's unfinished opera Ivan IV, a.k.a. Ivan Grozny, the awesome, the terrible. It is his charming trio based on a French Noël that brings us to the end of Holiday Lullabies from the Romantic era, at least the instrumental kind. Versus pour la nuit de Noël The Sleep of the Infant Jesus is the title of an old French Noël depicting the sleeping Jesus in the manger scene, surrounded by animals, flowers, and shepherds with the angelic choir overhead. Busset borrowed only the title for this lullaby for Christmas night, Versus pour la nuit de Noël. The composition itself is original, a trio for cello, harp, and organ. Busset remained faithful to the French 19th century tradition in his long career.
Our final continental European Christmas lullaby is from a Spanish composer. The Song of the Birds is a traditional Catalan Christmas song and lullaby. It tells of nature's joy at learning of the birth of Jesus in a stable in Bethlehem. The song was made famous outside Catalonia by an instrumental version on the cello by Pau Casals. More familiarly known as Pablo Casals, born in 1876 and dying in 1973. One of the greatest and most inspiring musicians of his time, he was Catalan by birth and reluctantly adopted the Spanish version of his Christian name to establish his playing career. He continued to compose under the Catalan version. The music of Casals is strongly rooted in Catalan folklore. Between his career as a cellist and teacher, almost single-handedly establishing the cello as a major concert instrument, and a long period working on a single large-scale piece, the Oratorio El Pesebre, meaning the manger, he wrote very few works, mostly songs and works in Catalan folk dance style. During Casal's long years of exile from Spain, following the victory of Francisco Franco's forces and the subjugation of Catalonia that followed, his Song of the Birds achieved the status of a symbol of the Catalan nation. It has a large number of arrangements for various combinations of instruments. You are about to hear a cello and piano arrangement from the 1970s.
art music lullabies give composers an excuse to write gentle music bathed in tender sweetness. As you can see, I have stretched the concept of a cradle song about as far as possible in order to provide a defining theme for presenting some of my favorite small-scale works. Call them Bersus's Vegan Leader, or more appropriately, Adagios, or Interludes. This music is heartwarming and simply lovely. So far, we have looked at lullabies for Christmas from continental Europe. Next time, we will look at Christmas lullabies from the English-speaking world, primarily British composers.
we will head on next time to cover lullabies for Christmas by British composers. Please remember to comment, subscribe, and keep listening to Art Music Lullabies. It is a good way to get the children to sleep. <laughs>